Well, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School lesson for August 2nd, 2020. Our study has been, is titled, Lessons from the Life of Abraham, and we're finishing Genesis chapter 22. What a chapter, Genesis chapter 22, has been. So much to learn, and yet, <laughs> so much to be learned. You say, well, that's a puzzling statement. Uh, well, you see, we can learn a lot from Genesis chapter 22, or from Abraham's life, for that matter. But the real learning, or the real application, takes place outside of the learning. Uh, in other words, outside of the classroom. It's when we take what we've learned and put it into application. So much to learn, and yet so much to be learned as we deal with the situations that come up in our life uh, Monday through Saturday. The real lessons are learned, I think, <laughs> outside of the classroom. <clears throat> the real lessons are learned outside the classroom. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Thus far, we've uh, considered a few thoughts from Genesis chapter 22 of the Father's heart. We considered that some weeks ago. Uh, so a few reflections of what Calvary meant to God the Father. Perhaps the only place in Scripture that gives us a glimpse into God the Father's heart as he sent his only Son, only begotten Son, to Mount Calvary to die for you and I. And then we've examined Abraham's faith, which was seen through the lens of his actions. His faith was exemplified in his actions on that journey uh, to uh, Mount Moriah and the offering of his son Isaac. We considered Isaac's example of submission. An example that succeeded only in Scripture by the submission of our Lord Jesus Christ to the will of His Heavenly Father. And then we looked ahead with Abraham, I might say. We looked ahead uh, to the final and complete fulfillment of all these things. Uh, this, pictured in, uh, this pictured here, uh, that is the atoning death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we considered a new name for God, Jehovah Jireh. God will see to it. God will take care of it. Amen. Today, we have just one final lesson from Genesis chapter 22, which I'll call the rewards of obedience. The rewards of obedience. That is Abraham's obedience. But there are rewards for our obedience as well. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, contains this sentence. The angel says to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Let's focus our thoughts just by way of introduction for a moment on this second phrase. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. You know, on the surface, it's just an unremarkable statement. It comes after a whole lot of really good stuff that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, promises the angel has made. And yet... Uh, Despite the fact that what came before was of seemingly greater importance, here is this phrase, because thou hast obeyed my voice. It may surprise you to learn that this is the first instance in Scripture, that is in the book of Genesis, the first instance in Scripture of the mention of this word obedience. And think, well, wait a minute, didn't other saints obey God? What about Noah? He obeyed God because he built the ark, right? And the Lord gave him the commands and the directions, the blueprints. Uh, well, yes, but the scripture doesn't say that word, obedience, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Uh, this word that's used in Hebrew for obeyed 
is a word that's actually used uh, many other times in Scripture, uh, even before this, uh, but it's not used in the sense of obey. It's used in, in the sense of hear, and that's how it's often translated, because you've heard uh, my voice. But here, it clearly means obedience, because you've obeyed. That's what Abraham did. He obeyed. Um, in fact, Abraham's obedience is a key and a central theme in Genesis chapter 22. And it's also significant that this first mention of the word obedience, because thou hast obeyed my voice, is accompanied by a reward. It says, because. <laughs> uh, in other words, because. <laughs> what more can I say? Abraham obeyed, and God then promised him all sorts of rewards, accompanied by rewards. Um, clearly, the Lord was pleased with Abraham's obedience. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, God was pleased with Abraham's obedience. And there are some characteristics of his obedience that I've put into your outline under the introduction. Uh, first, of all, first of all, Abraham's obedience was prompt. Promptness is a characteristic of obedience, a prompt obedience. When God spoke, you see, Abraham acted. Genesis chapter 16, verse 26, God spoke to Abraham, and it says, The self same day was Abraham circumcised. The same day the Lord said, uh, gave him the command, Abraham obeyed. Genesis chapter 21, verse 14. Abraham rose up early in the morning when he was sending Hagar and Ishmael out of the household. Genesis chapter 22, verse 3. Abraham rose up early in the morning. Again, promptness was a characteristic, a continual characteristic of Abraham's obedience. But his obedience was a sustained obedience. That was a characteristic of Abraham's obedience. It wasn't a a one and done kind of thing. I obeyed yesterday. <laughs> Isn't that enough, Lord? No, he had a lifetime of discipleship. He was a pilgrim and a stranger in the world, living in a tent all the days of his life, as far as we can tell. Abraham remained a pilgrim, a sustained obedience, um, a prompt obedience. There's also a willing obedience. There's different ways we can obey. Um, and obedience is good, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes we obey on the outside, but inside we're sort of grumbling. Um, this was not Abraham's case. It was a willing obedience. You see, Abraham delighted to do God's will. A characteristic of Abraham's obedience was determination as well. Undeterred by difficulties that came up, by um, opinions, <laughs> unswayed by opinions, that was Abraham. Uh, sure, steadfast and settled was Abraham's obedience. Sure, steadfast and settled, a determined obedience, a willing, a sustained, a prompt obedience, but it was also a contagious obedience. It was infectious, just like this pandemic that we're uh, going through now. It was infectious. It spread easily from one person to another. As Abraham was obedient to the Lord, his wife saw that, his son, his servants, and they said, I want to be like dad, like my husband, like our patriarch. I want to have a prompt obedience, sustained, willing, determined and a contagious obedience. And finally, it was a rewarded obedience. Because thou hast obeyed my voice, Genesis twenty two eighteen. Let's look at how Abraham's obedience was rewarded. Point one on your outline. There was a reaffirmation of the covenant. Let's read Genesis chapter 22, beginning with verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. 
and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. A reaffirmation of the covenant. The, we call it the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, it was a direct response to Abraham's obedience. Because thou hast done this thing. A direct response. The angel spoke a second time. <laughs> what a blessing that was. You know, there's uh, eight recorded instances in scripture where God spoke to Abraham. And this is the last. The angel spoke a second time to Abraham. The angel spoke the first time and said, Stop, uh, stay thy hand, and do no harm to thy son. Uh, but now the angel speaks a second time with these blessings. The God's pleasure is evident here and, and apparent to all. The, the covenant is the same covenant that's been given before. The Abrahamic covenant, uh, twice, it, it was given. It was given uh, first, I believe, in Genesis chapter 15, and then again uh, a, a little bit later. Uh, but here it's given a third time. The expression here and the description of the covenant far exceeds what Abraham had received earlier. Far exceeds. You see, each time the Abrahamic covenant is, is mentioned in Scripture, it, it grows and grows and grows. There's more yet to be seen. I'm sure there's more yet to be seen of this covenant. But it has expanded enormously. Matthew Henry says, Extraordinary services shall be crowned with, with extraordinary honors and comforts. Extraordinary services. Uh, that's what Abraham had performed there on Mount Moriah. Extraordinary services shall be crowned with extraordinary honors and comforts and favors in the promise, though not yet performed, ought to be accompanied, ought to be accounted real and valuable recompense. Favors in the promise. That's what the Lord is giving Abraham, is the promises. Uh, though they're not yet performed, Matthew Henry says, they haven't yet come about, they ought to be accounted real and valuable recompense. Real and valuable recompense. That's what the promises are. They're sure. They're steadfast. They will certainly come to take place. It was a reaffirmation of the covenant. It was also a ratification of of the covenant. The promises have already been given. Genesis chapter 12 uh, verses 2 and 3 the promise was first given. Uh, Genesis chapter 15 it was expounded upon. Why is it restated here? Well let's consider uh, three points. Some points of it. It was a ratification. A point B, 1B on your outline. It was a ratification. It was a reaffirmation. But the covenant first of all is Ratified with an oath. Verse 16. Uh, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham, in verse 15, and said, verse 16, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. By myself have I sworn. It was ratified with an oath. The Lord, you see, is most gracious in condescending to his people. And providing an oath. You see, <laughs> the Lord <clears throat> doesn't need an oath. His word is always true. Men swear oaths. God provided an oath for our benefit. For our benefit. An oath, you see, to, to us humans, <laughs> makes God's promises more secure. Uh, for those who are weak of faith, 
and encourages everyone who waits for the fulfillment of this promise. God's promised it with an oath. An oath, you see, puts an end to petty disputes uh, of which our society sees so many petty disputes. It puts an end to doubts. It puts an end to distrust. God swore with an oath here for our benefit. Our God swears by himself when making this oath. He says in verse 16, by myself, <laughs> by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this at some length in the New Testament. Uh, well, I think it's the Apostle Paul. It's in Hebrews. Uh, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Genesis, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. This is where God swears by himself. There is no greater uh, oath that God can make than to swear by himself. God made promise to Abraham and he swears by himself. You see, this covenant that God makes with Abraham remains in full force today. The Lord provides a ratification of the covenant, a reaffirmation. But thirdly, on your outline, a rarefaction. A rarefaction. I wanted to stick with the R's here. A rarefaction. The Abrahamic covenant here is enriched and expanded into a more lofty view. More details are provided. A more refined view. Uh, the Lord says, in blessing, I will bless. <laughs> that is, God's blessings keep on going. Even as God is blessing us, he's blessing. In blessing, I will continue to bless. Uh, God's blessings, you see, are not a, a one and done deal. One and done. God blessed us yesterday and there we have it. Uh, well, that would be wonderful, <laughs> but there's blessings today and tomorrow and the next day. And blessing, I will bless thee. Blessings will be brought to a state of perfect blessedness in due time. These blessings upon blessings upon blessings will reach a state of perfectedness. You see, we're not there. We need the Lord's blessings each and every day. But one day, <laughs> it'll all be perfected. God's not finished with us yet. He's not finished with me yet. He's not finished with you yet. In blessing, I will bless. In multiplying, I will multiply. <laughs> there we go again. It goes on and on and on. In multiplying, I will multiply. As the stars are in the heaven, so shall thy seed be. He says in verse 17, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens. Of the stars of the heaven. A, a naked eye, I've mentioned this before, uh, I haven't actually counted them, so I'm relying upon someone else who I guess has counted, but the naked eye can see approximately 3,000 stars if you get into a dark place, uh, which is hard to find nowadays. Um, but if you're in a, a dark place, uh, depending on what part of the sky you're looking at, southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, but say 3,000 stars in the human eye, that's a lot of descendants. But we know that that's not how many stars there are. <laughs> we have uh, telescopes now, and we can look at some of these fuzzy things you see up in the sky uh, and find out that they are clusters of stars. Some of them are clusters orbiting our galaxy, the Milky Way. And one of these medium-sized clusters of stars orbiting the Milky Way may contain 100,000 stars, a globular cluster. 100,000 stars orbiting the Milky Way. Of course, the Milky Way has got something like 5 billion stars. I haven't counted those either. Uh, neither has anybody, but they've uh, done some estimations. 5 billion stars in our Milky Way. And of course, there's other galaxies. The Andromeda Galaxy, uh, which is speeding toward us. Uh, one day, uh, the Lord should tarry. Another uh, couple of 
zillion years, uh, that Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy may collide, uh, pass through each other. Uh, but the Andromeda Galaxy is bigger. There's galaxies upon galaxies. Uh, there's a lot of stars. Uh, and the Lord, <laughs> he knew that. And so when Abraham looks up and he says, 3,000 stars, that's a lot. The Lord said, says in verse 17, um, and as the sand which upon which is upon the seashore, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Wow, sand. Now I can get a better picture for that. Uh, you start counting sand grains, and you you think there's a lot more than three thousand sand grains here on this one little beach. How many other beaches are there? in the world. And of course, sand is not just found in beaches. Uh, it's found in uh, uh, huge deposits, river beds, uh, uh, ancient river beds, places where perhaps a flood has washed sand. Sand is everywhere. Henry Morris, Dr. Henry Morris estimated, uh, um, and I'm just going on his estimation, that the number of grains of sand on the earth approximately equals what we believe to be the number of stars in the universe. Roughly 10 to the 25th. And that's a one followed by 25 zeros, which is a very large number. Um, that's a, a lot of descendants. The Lord is saying too many to count. <laughs> too many to count. That will be your descendants, Abraham. Uh, in multiplying, I will multiply. In blessing, I will bless thee. Verse 17. And multiplying, I will multiply thee, thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. You know, boy, <laughs> I have to say, Genesis chapter 22 is becoming a little dog-eared in my Bible. But uh, you know, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. In, in olden days, when there was walls around the city uh, for defense, before we had cannons and things that would uh, blow holes in those walls. Um, a wall was a secure defense. You couldn't actually capture a city. You could just starve it into submission. Uh, sometimes it took years uh, to starve a city into submission. Uh, but if you possessed the gate, the city was yours. The gate was the weakest point. Uh, a gate of a massive oak. <laughs> You've seen those battering rams. Uh, but here the Lord promises Abraham that his seed will possess the gate of his enemies. Now, you could take that to mean uh, that Abraham's seed will be triumphant, uh, his, the Hebrew people, over their enemies. and Indeed, they were many times. Uh, but I look at it from a further view. that It's a messianic promise. Thy seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, will triumph over the enemies of God. He'll possess the gate of Satan himself and all his wicked demons. I rather think that's the complete and ultimate fulfillment of this promise. You know, just back for a moment to that phrase, thy seed shall be as the sands, uh, as the stars in the heaven and as the sands upon the seashore. You know, our eyes at times only see a few believers. Here and there, we see someone who's living for the Lord, and yet God promises that there's more. That Christians are found in every place in this world. Every place. You know, our missionaries go, and, and we. it's right, it's good to send missionaries, uh, but when they get there, <laughs> they're not the first. Uh, there's other believers. All of our missionaries have aligned themselves uh, uh, with other believers uh, to learn the language, the culture, uh, then to go out and spread the gospel into a needy area. Uh, but there's other believers who are already there because God's promises are true and they're already being fulfilled. It was uh, God's blessings are promised through Abraham. The increase of the church in multiplying, I will multiply. A victory over wickedness in hell. Uh, Abraham will possess the gates 
of his enemies, his descendants, his seed, and the coming of the Messiah. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Clearly a messianic promise. We saw reaffirmation of the covenant. But now we see the return of the company. The return of the company, verse 19 in Genesis chapter 22. It says, And Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. The return of the company. It sounds like something out of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I know. But it's, it's, it's accurate. They returned. It clearly an anticlimactic event. After that mountaintop experience at Mount Moriah, I mean, <clears throat> leaving us breathless, I have to say, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the verses we've just read should leave you breathless. And now we have this anticlimactic statement. They returned. They went back. Uh, why is that in Scripture? Well, I believe there's a lesson from the life of Abraham in each and every verse. A lesson. Uh, first of all, the obvious. We don't live on mountaintops. We don't live on Mount Moriah. We must return uh, to our mundane, <laughs> everyday lives. Uh, that's what Abraham did. That's where we live out our faith. It's not on the mountaintops, not in the revival services uh, or the worship service, but in the home, in the community. The obvious, we don't live on mountaintops. Uh, the business of life occurs in Beersheba. Um, not in Bible conferences, not even in our Sunday school hour. Business of life occurs in Beersheba. And it's a lesson on faithfulness. The return of the company. They returned to Beersheba. And Abraham returned to his place of service. There in Beersheba. The head of the family. Uh, he began to manage his servants again. And conduct his household. And um, deal with his enemies. Abraham returns to the struggles and the sorrows of life. But God's promises are still echoing in his heart. And they're seen in his example. His example of daily faithfulness. The return of the company. And then we see some news about relatives and their children. Relatives and their children. News from afar. It says in verse 20 of Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Abraham. And she said, And Hazel, Hazel Pildash, Jedlap, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Rima. She bare also Tiber, and Geham, and Thahash, and Mekah. Wow! <laughs> Why is that there in Scripture? Uh, relatives and their children. You see, it was news from afar. News didn't often come Abraham's way. But here comes some news from the far country. Uh, Abraham's brother, Nahor, had been blessed with 12 sons. It was a blessing for Abraham to know the prosperity of his brother. His brother was doing, doing well. It was also a reminder. God has other people scattered about. Abraham may have felt kind of all alone there in the land of the Canaanites in Beersheba. But other believers existed. The focus here is on Abraham. But Abraham is not alone in the world in his faith. A reminder. But thirdly, and most importantly, this is a providential piece of news. Uh, this news <laughs> undoubtedly... Uh, sets the stage for Abraham's arrangements that he makes 
in chapter 23. He needs to find a bride for Isaac a few years later. And perhaps it just comes back to Abraham's mind. Oh yeah, I received some news from a far country. My brother, Nahor, had 12 sons. And one granddaughter, <laughs> by the way, the only second generation descendant named in this news is a, a girl, a woman named Rebecca. I don't know if you believe in providence, uh, but if you don't, you should. Because you see, our Lord is in control of all events that occur in this world. Providence. And here we see God's providence. Um, even in this piece of news that comes to Abraham, Rebecca, there could be, perhaps, a bride for Isaac from among my own people, a believer. I'll send my servant. Abraham's going to say it in a few verses. I'll send my servant uh, to look and see if he can find a bride for my son Isaac. I'll send him to my relatives. It just so happens the servant comes upon a young woman named Rebecca, who becomes Isaac's bride. That's providence. God is at work, even in the very smallest of things. And so we have this little passage of scripture of relatives and their children, uh, and yet a providential piece of news for Abraham. I trust this study through Genesis chapter 22 has been a blessing to you uh, as much as it has been to me uh, to teach this material. It's such a wonderful chapter, but we'll be moving on in Abraham's life and his lessons into Genesis chapter 23 next week. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the lessons we've learned uh, from the life of Abraham. But I pray mostly, Lord, most of all, that we would take these lessons and put them into application in our own lives. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.